Hey, so hey, hey. We're just in time. We just I just hit record. All right. Um. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna get started because you know don't want to be here for a personal reason. So before we do get right into the lecture, just a few quick announcements. Please join the IEEE Discord. Um, we've sent email notifications about the first few lectures and you know other stuff like that. But eventually we'll start phasing that out and just use the Discord primarily. Um, if anyone has like a huge objection to Discord being the method of communication, let us know and we'll set something else up. But I just don't like email, man. It's not efficient. Um, yeah, so what's cool about Discord is you can also help each other, so that's fun. Um, what else? Deposits are due today. Um, like right now, I'm pretty right. sure everyone in this room has done it, but for people who are watching the recording, I think there's a few people in the project who haven't paid their deposits yet. Uh, we we'll start reaching out to you more and more, and then eventually, in a week or so, we we'll start talking to people. So please get your deposits in. Um, it's just a way to make let us know that you're committed to the project, and if you're not interested in the project, then this is a good way to like do that first business test. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, last announcement is a uh, not related to RAP specifically. It's an IEEE wide thing. So IEEE has something called General Board or GB. It's a group of about six to 10 students who are part of a group led by about two to three officers or really active members. Usually they'll be juniors or seniors, so upperclassmen. The point of these is that you kind of get together in groups, you do a whole bunch of social activities together, you hang out together, you have a lot of fun. And it also gives you like a small close-knit family of people yeah. you can go to for you know familiar faces in classes. Yeah. You can talk to the people leading the GP for advice on classes, professors, who to avoid like a plague, whom to whom you should really take, stuff like that. Even about internships, research, all, all everything electrical engineering at UCLA. And it's it's also a lot of fun, you know, you, you do all sorts of fun socials with them. So I yeah. think more information about that is yeah, probably there's a, there's in the Discord. Uh, yes, there's an info session this Friday. Uh, I forgot the room, but it's from 6 to, or maybe it's 7 to 8.30, or is 6 to 7.30. It's on Friday. I think yeah. it's um, 7 to 8.30. 7 to 8.30, there we Second go. One. Um, right. So yeah, you should you should check it out. See the different officers and people who are leading GBs. They all pitch, you know, the vision they have. See if anyone any of them sound interesting. They're, they're a good time. Right. Um, and finally, really quick for the people in the room. So and and you know, uh, so what we'll start doing from the second assignment onwards is at the end of every assignment, we'll include a small anonymous form where we're collecting feedback on what the assignment was like. Um, primarily, we're concerned with was two weeks enough. Um, and was it uh, was the assignment thorough enough to like when you read it you knew what you needed to do? And third, um, did the assignment actually help you apply what we discussed <coughs> in the lecture to the extent that if you had to design an equivalent version of it yourself, you feel confident in being able to tackle that? Um, so moving forward from assignment two, that will be a form. But for now, we just wanted to. I don't know, just real quick, were there any huge problems in assignment one that you want us to fix in assignment two? Good, bad, okay. Good, all right, fantastic. Um, let's get started with today's lecture then. Today we'll be talking about two things. One, what oscillators are, why we use them, why they're useful, and uh, that's, that's actually the same thing. So what roughly what an oscillator is and why we use it. And second, the specific oscillator that we'll be using, the four bits oscillator, and then we'll go into explaining some of the theory about, hey, here's the circuit diagram, and here's why it works, and here's how you choose the components to use within it. Um, so let's start with what an oscillator is. Um, pretty self-explanatory name, actually. It's a circuit block that oscillates at a certain, certain frequency and provides to you a out a sinusoidal output with a stable frequency. What's up, sir? Are you sharing slides? Or no. no. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have access to the projector oh. because they lock it at 6. Oh, um, the slides that we do have, we'll be posting after the lecture. Oh. But most of this lecture is going to be on the whiteboard anyways. We don't plan on, the, the slides are more for your reference when you're doing the assignment oh. later. Um, all right. So you <laughs> the one that uh, so that's what an oscillator is. It just produces a stable sinusoidal um, output for you um, at a you know constant voltage, constant frequency, all that good stuff. So what are we going to use uh, them for in RF systems? Um, they're going to be used to drive our up converters and down converters, which is something we'll be discussing in our next lecture when we start talking about mixer. Um, and so just really quickly though, um, 
the idea is if this is your frequency domain, so if this is your frequency domain, um, and this is amplitude, and you know you have some signal you have here, and this is going to typically be at a relatively low frequency. If you recall, we discussed in the first lecture where we talked about the system as a whole that our microcontroller outputs at one megahertz. And we need to be um, transmitting at you know, 27 megahertz. So if you recall from 102, um, multiplication in the time domain is convolution in frequency domain. So if I have some stable frequency here, and then I convolve them, and I you know, drag through this, if I choose this frequency right, I can basically create a version of this over here. But to be able to do all, and you know, there'll be negative frequency components to some parts of this and all of that, but I'm ignoring these for now. Um, but to be able to do this, I need to be able to produce this thing, which is where our oscillator comes in, in terms of its ability to provide this stable frequency. Um, so that's what you use oscillators for. Um, you can generate oscillators in a whole bunch of ways. You can use uh, in the most basic form, if you recall from like 10 and 110, you can use LC tanks. Um, then you can use like crystal oscillators, which use the vibration of, they do, they do something with the crystal within them to like measure a stable uh, period, and they use those to output their uh, frequency. So there's different types of oscillator. Um, the one we'll be using is called the Colpitz oscillator. It's a form of LC tank oscillator. Yep. Okay, so uh, think back to uh, physics 1C or Orbiel, anything like this. So what happens when you have an inductor, you have a capacitor, it has some charge on it. Uh, it has some, let's see, this is LC. So in a perfect world, this capacitor has some charge and I say, okay, go. What will it do? It'll produce uh, a sinusoidal output uh, with the uh, frequency uh, given by one over square root LC. Yeah. So, um, so we're done, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. All right. Cool. So there, there's one problem with this. If you put in, in real life, you put an inductor, have a capacitor. Parallel, series, whatever, and you charge it up and let it go, uh, it's very quickly going to decay. And that's because uh, real life components, especially this inductor, is going to have some parasitic series resistance. So instead of uh, having a stable oscillation, it might do something like a, you charge it up and then very quickly it will start to decay out to nothing because uh, this resistor is going to dissipate some energy each cycle, right? So, so what do we do with this? Um, the, the whole premise of, the whole challenge of building an oscillator is to design some circuit to inject just the right amount of charge at the right time so that instead of decaying or growing out of control, we have just a, I don't know, we, we just have a stable amplitude uh, for, the, for that. So let's see, so a uh, circuit that uh, does exactly that is going to be what's called the Colpitz oscillator. I'm just going to draw on the slide real quick and then we'll kind of walk through what it does. Okay, so we have our inductor, now we have two capacitors. Um, please hold. We don't have our slides to make it really sad. Um, what do we have here? Um, 
we might recognize one part of it uh, right over here. So we have essentially the LC tank we had earlier. We have, now it's two capacitors, but they're in series. So two capacitors, uh, our inductor, and then some series resistance. So we have our LC tank. Uh, but then we have this uh, other circuit over here. I'll just uh, make it more clear. Nice. So this is the common collector amplifier that we kind of introduced at the end of lecture one. So uh, you can see how, okay, we have, a, we have our resonant LC tank, and then we've added on this amplifier block over here, and then the output of the amplifier, you see that's going into, the, uh, into our LC tank, and then uh, we see the, we can take an output from the LC tank and feed that back into the amplifier. So in other words, we have some kind of feedback loop system. Um, let's see, yeah, so, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of say, okay, here's this circuit I proposed that it's the Colpitz oscillator, and it does exactly what we need to. Has, it uh, injects just the right amount of charge to sustain oscillation. So uh, now let's demonstrate why that's the case. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess first we can uh, abstract away from uh, this. So essentially we have a we have a, some block here and then an amplifier. So let's draw it more as a feedback system. So uh, let's, call it, let's say that the red block is going to be a, a transfer function A, and then that goes into the green block over there uh, trans with the transfer function beta and B, and they just kind of feed into each other. Um, so that's more a schematic way to represent represent that circuit in a general sense. Um, let's say this is our output voltage. And let's say, uh, let's just call this our feedback voltage. So that's what's being fed back into the amplifier block. Okay. I wrote the same question. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, if we have a system, a uh, we just have a control loop like this. Uh, in order for it to oscillate, there's there are two conditions that must be true. Um, they fall under the Barkhausen uh, stability criterion. I'll just write what they are. Um, don't worry about the name. So one, um, the loop gain a and b must be greater than or equal to one, and then two. Uh, phase shift to zero. Very good. Okay, so when you when you look at this to start off with this kind of abstract, like oh, what a times b must be greater than or equal to one. Phase shift to zero. What what do we make of this? So um, I'm going to use an analogy to kind of show like show this in a more intuitive way. So let's say I am a psychopath and I really like the sound that you get when you take a microphone and put it right next to the speaker. And it makes this terrible squealing sound, right? So uh, let's, let's draw ourselves a speaker. That's a really nice speaker, isn't it? Um, and, uh, uh, and then microphone, then we have, say we have some Amplifier block. Uh, I don't think capture. the camera will be able to capture. That. No, we're pretty sure. Oh, okay. Okay. We just tested. Yeah. Thank you, though. Okay, so let's see. So we. Let's, I guess, okay, so let's say we have some sound wave and then it gets attenuated a little bit by the air, gets picked up by microphone, and then uh, goes through an amplifier with gain A. Uh, let's, let's, yeah. So, let's see. So, this is kind of similar to this system in that, uh, think about this, uh, just think about it in terms of the, the LC tank. The, when the sound waves travel through the air, it gets attenuated as it, as it spreads out, right? So, it's kind of similar like the, the wave or the, the 
oscillating current will kind of uh, decrease as it as power gets dissipated by this resistor. So the analog of that over here would be the attenuation through the air. Um, so um, you get that terrible squealing sound if you're too close. Um, and then if you, but if this, uh, if you move far away enough and you don't turn the volume up, the amplifier is some fixed amount, then at a certain point, the, uh, the amplification factor uh, will, at, at an exact point, it'll exactly match the attenuation through the air and it'll be a stable volume. And as soon as you move a little bit closer, it'll fade down to nothing. So uh, what natural thing to do when you hear that sound is like turn the volume down, move away. So you decrease A, move away to increase the attenuation factor. Um, this is kind of the reverse though, because we actually want oscillation. Um, so let's see, so that's kind of an analogy to explain what the A times B is greater than or equal to one means. Um, we need the gain as we uh, go through the air or go through our LC tank and then go through our amplifier. We need to uh, can't we need to be greater than the power dissipated over here. The amplifier is too small. Then even though we're we might be amplifying our signal a little bit, um, it's still not greater than the resistor. The resistor will win out and end up dissipating all our energy. So uh, you won't get any signal of output. So another way to think about it. A times B having to be greater than equal to one is assuming your capacitor is already perfectly charged and you're simply, you know, letting it oscillate, you basically want A times B to be equal to exactly one because you want whatever's being produced out of your tank, which is EF, to be exactly at the output. The reason we say greater than equal to one is because your capacitors aren't charged. They're discharged because you bought them off of DigiKey and DigiKey doesn't sell you charged capacitors. Um, and so, or Mauser, you know, we're, we're equal opportunity buyers over here. <laughs> and so, and so, um, and so the reason you have this greater than equal to one condition is because you need that additional bit of energy to get the oscillations going. You need them to get started. Um, this is something you see in the assignment as well, is like this idea of a pickup time for the oscillator for it to like let some of the transients settle out when it's first charging for the first few times. Um, and it's discussed in the assignment about you want to like view its behavior a few periods after zero and, and other things like that. But that, that's where the greater than part of this comes from because intuitively you might think if we want a stable oscillation, we should just stick with one. But you want slightly larger than one um, just to let it kick start and get moving and, and then it kind of stables itself yeah. out. In simulation, when you see this, when you plot the output, you'll see that first it like starts to the flat and then it picks up. Then it gets up to a large amplitude and then it levels off. And then it's stable from then on. So uh, just the whatever charge is in there from thermal noise, whatever, it, it needs to get amplified up. But then once it gets large enough, the gain will end up reducing down to exactly one. And that will tell us what our output amplitude is. OK, um, let me briefly explain the other one. So. Does it kind of make sense that A times B greater than or equal to one condition? There's an analogy if it helps. So why does phase shift have to equal zero? Um, let's let's go back here. Let's say my amplifier uh, factor was like five billion, and I was right next to this. I was really close to the speaker. Um, even if that's a given, if I am uh, at a spot in the signal where I'm picking up, so let's say the speaker is outputting here and I'm picking up right here, then I'm picking up the, the signal um, out of phase with itself. So when uh, it goes back to a system, it'll add to itself and destructively in a, interfere. So you could think of it like, oh, fuck, you're getting that bad sound. If you move half a wavelength over, then now it's picking up out of phase and it cancels itself out. Um, so that's why the phase shift, uh, as it goes through this whole system, needs to be zero no matter what A times B is. Because um, you need the signal to add on constructively with itself, not destructively as well. Cool analogy for that, physics 1C, Young's uh, double slit experiment, kind of something like that, right? Uh, you don't want dark spots in your system because that basically means your V out is zero, you want to be in the light. 
Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of, so we need these two conditions to be true in order for this circuit to oscillate. So that as a given, let's, uh, so let's make these two conditions true for those circuit values. Now we get to start choosing what capacitors and inductor and resistors we want to use to make these two conditions true. Okay. So I'm just going to call this L, call this RS, P2, P1. This is our emitter resistor. That that capacitor is just a peak coupling one, it's value that yeah. okay. um, cool. So what we're going to do first is we're going to look at the uh, transfer function for this uh, circuit here. So uh, for the LC tank. So we have this is V out, and we already labeled uh, VF is out there. So let me go ahead and uh, redraw this over here. So um, everyone's taken Z and hopefully. Um, so the uh, so the impedance of uh, capacitor is going to be minus J. Uh, this is representing a C2, so I'm just going to say minus J X2 minus J X1. For an inductor, it should be J X L. There's our um, let's see what this is value. So, all this apart? Good. Okay, so uh, what is a, uh, so V is equal to VF over our output over input. Um, let's see, there's a, there's a very nice trick here. Um, does anyone see it? Anyone have a guess? Do we know like a hybrid pi? Nope. Um, let's see. We're, we're not looking at our uh, transistor yet. Um, let's see. Right here, we, we, have, uh, we have three impedances in series. Um, we're taking the output of two of them. It's just a voltage divider. Um, so uh, let's see. I should do this up here. So it's just going to be these two added together, divided by on the wall. So it's going to be JXL plus RS over JXL plus RSS and then plus minus JX1. Okay. Bye would you like to explain what XL is at the resonant frequency? Sure. Let's do it. So Tyler was talking about how this resonant tanks is res resonant tank. Some reso ins or eight, I don't know man, grammar. Uh, reso something tank is uh, re reminiscent of uh, this one, right? Um, I can't draw for the inductors like Tyler, so this isn't a resistor, it's an inductor. Um, so you have L, and you have some C affected. Uh, if you think about just this here, it's these two capacitors in series. And so C effective is equal to capacitors in series, guys. It's the uh, parallel over resistor the version. Parallel resistor version, product over the sum. And so omega naught is equal to one over root L C effective. Um, then we also know that XL is equal to omega L and XC is equal to one over omega C. Um, if you plug these values in and you, you know, um, 
take omega naught and find how this behaves at resonance, you will find that XL is equal to X1 plus X2. Um, this is really, really easy to prove to yourselves. In fact, I would encourage you to do that if you have like two minutes free later in the evening. Um, if you have questions about this, you can come to us in lab hours and we can go over it with you, but it, it should just be just plug this in, put it where my guys and we get that. Okay, so the point is, if there's charge in here, this part of the circuit wants to resonate at that resonant frequency, and at that particular frequency, uh, we can say that uh, XL is equal to X1 plus X2. Actually, one, one quick thing to also think about with respect to our phase shift criteria of zero here. If my imaginary components all cancel out, meaning this behaves purely real, and we already saw earlier that the gain for our common collector in lecture one is purely real. If you put those together, can you see how then your phase shift across both those conditions comes out to zero as a result of operating the LC tank at its resonant frequency? So this is, this is also really, this is also like a really important thing to note from this, from uh, what we discussed about our stability criteria. Yeah, we'll, we'll stress it again in just a second. Yeah. So, so let's substitute that in. So uh, J uh, L D J X one plus J S two plus S. All over. Uh, I'm going to properly subtract that X one, so it's just going to be J X two uh, plus R S as a denominator. All right, bye, Bob. What is R R S? All right. Um. Here again, um, if you remember our discussion on impedance transformers, we discussed something called quality factor. Um, quality factor, the definition isn't super useful, but for, for the purpose of defining it, it's defined as the ratio of ideal power you would get back from a reactive component to the amount of power you actually dissipate in every cycle of charging it up and charging it down. So in an inductor, that's caused because of the resistance of the wire, because of the hysteresis, if it has a, a magnetized core, and other such things. In a capacitor, it's caused by similar things with its dielectric uh, elasticity and you know, it's, its own inbuilt resistance and stuff like that. Um, but if you remember what we discussed about parallel components having a quality factor, it is Q is equal to our series series components, sorry, Q is equal to XL over RS. Um, you can also think of this in terms of the power definition I just gave you, where the power through a, you know, and it's in series, so the current is the same, and so it's just XL over RS, but for the purpose of this conversation, so this is this. So the reason this is important is because, again, if you go to Digiki or Mouser, you will find that any reactive component you're buying, and maybe not so frequently capacitors, but especially inductors, uh, when you start looking at um, inductors of the smaller type of values that you would use for RF circuits and other such frequency dependent circuits, they will all have something called a quality factor in their data sheet and their manufacturer provided information. What that lets you know then is at your frequency, because X is just omega L, and you know what quality factor that inductor is built at, you can find RS. Now, typical values for quality factor will vary with inductance. Smaller inductors can have higher quality factors. Larger inductors will usually have lower quality factors. You can think of this as, you know, you need more wire to wind the larger inductor, which means the resistance would also get higher. Um, for our project, and this is something mentioned in the assignment sheet as well, we'll be assuming a quality factor of about you know, let's say something less than 40, but the point being this will usually be pretty big. Um, typical values will range in say the mid 30s to for a small enough inductor, 140, 150. All of which to say, RS is fucking small, dude. <laughs> <laughs> any any really questions about that? Yeah. yeah. Well, so we have a cool equation to see what the series resistance is going to be. And uh, as Vi Bob uh, so eloquently said, uh, it's really, it's really small. <laughs> um, so um, that said, we're going to do some engineering magic and just they're gone now. Um, thank, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, these J's now it's going to be. Uh, We end up with uh, this D is just 
going to be. Tyler, you want to move that to the top of the board here? Yes, I Um, if you want it in terms of C1 and C2, uh, the math works out so it's C1 plus C2 over C1. Uh, so, um, and you, you, you can see here that there's no imaginary component to the transfer function of this LC tank at the resonant frequency in particular, uh, which, which Weibo said means the input here the output there will be in no phase shift. Uh, we already know here. It's an emitter, a common collector. It's also called emitter follower. So when the input goes up, the output goes up, vice versa. So there's no phase shift there. All in all, at the resonant frequency, this acts purely real, and there's no phase shift. Um, and we found uh, the transfer function <coughs> is just going to be C1 C2 over C1. Um, let's see. So we can see here that this is actually this can actually be greater than one, which might seem a little counterintuitive at first. You're going through a purely passive component circuit. There's no there's no active transistors or anything there. So how do you get voltage gain? Uh, but the key phrase there is voltage gain. Um, what what this essentially does is it might trade off some current and transform it into so it'll be a, a reduction in the current, um, but uh, amplification of the voltage, but no power gain. Um, so there's that. Is there anything else to say about this? Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay. So in the entire circuit, what you're doing is you're taking the output, feeding it in as the, wait, so like, I'm just confused, like where is your output and where is your input? Okay. Um, so. Because on the left diagram, you drew a field there as if there's like an input voltage and you're measuring it across the after, right? Okay. These, these arrows are just corresponding to our LC tank. We imagine like uh, this spot right here, mm -hmm. the output of our amplifier mm -hmm. is right here. Mm -hmm. And for a feedback network, you Go through oh, so some. Oh, it's a feedback. Okay. You go through this feedback block here. Mm -hmm. and we've said we said that this block here is, is the LC tank, is the LC tank. Mm -hmm. and then the output of that goes back in, and we know the input to the amplifier is just going to be through the base decoupling capacitor. Oh, okay. Okay, is that clear now? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So uh, there's that. We have the. Uh, so we have V. We know that. At the resonant frequency, there will be zero phase shift. All that's left is we need to find A and find uh, under what conditions that thing is satisfied. So uh, from lecture one, uh, the gain of a common collector. Yeah, uh, yeah we can get rid of that. If you're basically doing a feedback to keep the oscillation stable yes. yep. and to prevent it from decaying. Yep. That's exactly, exactly what we're doing. Okay, yeah. uh, so the gain is going to be C. Isn't it really good that I wipe the part of the thing? Okay. Times the, the whatever the load impedance seen from there is all over. So, yeah, gain is GM times the load impedance all over GM times load impedance plus one. Um, so let's. So we we know GM based on how we bias. We we can control that by how we bias our uh, transistor. So what we need to find is what is uh, what is GM. So uh, let's say we go out of our amplifier and then. Uh, we go into what? What do we see? Uh, we so at the output of the amplifier, we see oh, there's a the emitter resistor going to ground. So there's uh, that. And we say R E, and then uh, see over here. There's our exact same LC tank uh, from earlier.
that one. Gonna be whatever the impedance looking into the base of the uh, transistor is, which is it's R5. Okay. Well, it's R1 in parallel with R2 in parallel with. Yes. Uh, so, oh, so what happened to the impedance looking into the middle? Which one? I'll just say I'll just call this RV, whatever the resistance looking in. What is the resistance looking into the emitter? The RE. Looking into the emitter. Why? Why? Why are you concerned with looking yeah, into the that, emitter? Yeah, we're. Aren't you calculating the out? No, we're, we're oh. calculating the load. We're calculating the load seen at the emitter. At the emitter. This is this isn't out. This is the load seen at the emitter. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is basically the voltage between this point and ground divided by the voltage flowing down here, where the current flowing down here. Mm -hmm. So we're not concerned with the resistance looking up there. Oh, so we're looking at the loading resistance. Working in such. Yeah. Okay. So uh, time for some more. Uh, you, you remember this? Let's do it again. Um, so if you build your circuit right, RE is going to be quite large, and with that assumption, this could. Uh, basically, we choose C2 and C1 purposefully so that we can say RE is much larger at the operating frequency so that we can get more. So that, that's a choice you make with C2 and C1 so that, similar to what you did for the bypass capacitors, you make it so that RE is negligible. Yes. And RB is the resistance of the transistor? Yeah. Uh, or looking in. Looking so in so RB is the voltage here, the here divided by the current flowing in here. So that would be like R1 parallel with R2 parallel with R5, R5 reflected to the and RE. And so it's basically some resistance here. So the resistance looking in here. Okay. Can you say that this is really, yeah. really large? Yeah, the biasing resistors will be pretty large. So, okay. yeah. so that goes away as well. And we're left with this. So, what, so we need to find the... Uh, It's looking in here. It's just going to be the impedance of our LCD tank. Uh, now we have three impedances in series, and that's all in parallel with this capacitor. So, uh, so all the L ends up being in the. That makes a lot of sense. It's going to be um, okay, and then when, so if you have some of all these um, in parallel with this, like Bob showed earlier, it's going to be the product of its sum, right? So we got to actually uh, how I got that here, uh, multiplied by uh, minus j, then the sum of all that. So. Okay. Uh, here is it, but the assumption from earlier that uh, xl is equal to x1 plus x2 at uh, the frequency um, still still applies. Um, so you can see that this xl is going to become jx1 plus jx2. You subtract jx1 and jx2, so the denominator just becomes r sub s. And uh, in the, this expression, we end up with uh, so the jx2 term will still Stick around. Then, I'm here just have our S. Um, multiply those all. 
all together, we get a two squared minus j minus two rs over rs. Once again, this term is insignificant compared to this because of that rs. So just say. Approximately two squared all over r sub x. Okay. So if you plug that back into that expression, so you know that the, the gain factor is going to be a there. It's just going to end up being um, g m squared. Okay, so if you multiply that thing with this thing and say it has to be greater than or equal to one, um, it's just a bit of algebra, but you end up getting that gm must be greater than or equal to the present frequency squared times c1, c2. So this is kind of the magic equation for a cold pits oscillator. Um, if you set your GM sufficiently or larger than this uh, expression here, so your resonant, the frequency you're looking for, um, and then everything multiplied together, then what you end up having is a it'll sustain oscillation. If GM is too small, uh, it will not. Um, there's, there's a few things to notice here. One is that C it's multiplied by RS on the right hand side. So you can kind of see that if this LC tank were perfect, didn't dissipate any, uh, any power whatsoever, then GM could just be zero and you just have your LC tank, right? Um, so you, it kind of makes sense that the worse your inductor is, the larger RS is, and the more you have to compensate for it by uh, having a larger gain uh, in your amplifier. Um, what's that? Uh, just, I, I think I missed a, a part of your explanation. Yeah. What happened to uh, the resistance at the emitter? At the emitter? Um, this RE is going to be, uh, so we pick C1, C2, L, and RE such that at the frequency of interest, this uh, emitter resistor is going to be much larger than these guys. So effectively it looks like an open circuit, so you can just get rid of it. Or it doesn't significantly impact this calculation. RS is something you look up on the data sheet, right? The inductor? Um, you won't find RS, you'll find quality factor, because RS will vary with the frequency. Ah, uh, cool. And then you just say that quality factor is XL over RS. Yes. Perfect, yeah. Okay. Um, Make us on by Bob. Wow, what do we make of this? I mean, there isn't much to make of it. That's it. So <laughs> that's your circuit. Um, the main things you want to keep in mind is you start by calculating this out with the, or let's see, you start by finding out what frequency you want, right? Um, and the assignment will walk you through it. But a good way to make some of the math simpler is to start by saying C1 is equal to C2. Right, and just to start from there, because why not? So then all your C1, C2s just become C squared, and then you're solving for one number instead of like two variables in all your equations. So you start with the omega naught you want. Um, that gives you a ballpark for you know L and C. You can fix one arbitrarily to start with and get the ball rolling. Um, from there, you find the GM you need. You design your emitter. You find you know everything you need, and then you check some of your assumptions. Did the GM you need and the design requirements that put on you make RE such that C2 was in fact small? If not, that means you need to increase RE. Increasing RE will change your GM, which means you probably need to revisit what value you chose for C1 and C2, and then you iterate through that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of conflicting kind of 
design goals are like, oh, I want to make GM large, but I want to keep my RS small, or I want to keep the power consumption reasonable, et cetera. Um, let's see. So the assignment will kind of walk through how to how to take the values and yeah. what things to keep in mind as you go through. Um, okay, I have just one question in terms of like the larger scheme of the project. Okay. We talked about this like in the first couple minutes. Where exactly are we? Where and why are we going to be using this focus offering? All right, that's a really good question, and that starts getting into some of the details of the assignment that I want to start discussing right now. So. Before we get to that though, were there any other questions about this part of it? Yes. So, just to confirm, we don't really care about the actual inductance of the inductor. We care more about the, uh, well, I guess the associated quality factor, which is a function of the inductance. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. Oh, all right, well, if you have any other questions, always feel free to reach out to us. Um, to get to your question about where we use these and what we use them for. Um, so I talked about we're doing multiplication in the time domain, mm -hmm. contribution yeah. in the frequency domain, stuff like that. Um, that's an operation that we're going to be doing in hardware in our project. We're going to be using something called a mixer, which we'll get into in, the, in lecture three. Mm -hmm. And as the name suggests, it mixes Frequencies. You, you, you've seen you've seen the scary circuit block in Mono 22, yeah. 13. So uh, basically, you have let's just say we have some uh, baseband information carrying signal. I'll just say call it. It has frequency x, uh, whatever. Um, and then uh, over here we have a let's just say we have a carrier signal. It's just a sinus wave. It's fixed at frequency f. So if we multiply them together, then what we'll end up with in the in the spectrum of the alpha signal, we'll get uh, something centered around uh, plus x, as a sum frequency, and then... Uh, yeah, I guess, plus, something minus x. Like. So, okay. Minus x, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you can filter out one of them, so you get one of mm -hmm. you're left with the other one. Yeah. So if... Uh, if we have some baseband uh, information carrying, carrying signal coming out of our uh, microcontroller at one megahertz, mm -hmm. but we need to be at 27 megahertz to transmit, mm -hmm. um, then we do what's called modulation using a mixer. So we generate, uh, we can generate a 28 uh, megahertz uh, signal using the Colpitz oscillator. Mm -hmm. Send that into the mixer, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about next lecture, and then. Uh, the signal that your microcontroller generates, yep. and then you get something. And then you get these two. You filter out one of them. Mm -hmm. So twenty-eight, uh, one twenty-eight minus one. So we filter out the, uh, the higher one. We're left with our signal of yeah. interest, and then uh, you can send that to your more amplifiers to go into your antenna. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is pretty much how do we generate using hardware a signal that goes into our mixer to, it's our, how do we generate our car carrier frequency signal to uh, perform modulation? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, so um, talking about the assignment really quick then, um, and we'll you know, put it on the drive, there's two stages to this assignment. The first one is kind of similar to assignment one, we're just having you design a simple common collector amplifier in this case. Um, pretty close to what we did in assignment one, we've given you some specs, you choose out the right bias point, attach the load, basically see how input and output impedance behaves, see if it agrees with the theory, um, it, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, the next part of the assignment is where you now start forming into groups. So if you remember at the end of lecture one, we talked about how when you start actually building the physical components that your system needs, you'll start coming into your groups of four and you know work out however you want to design your receivers and transmitters. So there's a sign-up sheet. It's linked on the slides and it's an Excel file in the shared drive. I will also remember to post that sign-up link in the Discord channel for wrap links so that you can find it there as well. Um, we won't allow teams of larger than four, um, but given the number of people in the project, there might be a few teams that are smaller than four, that's fine. 
Um, so in terms of checkoffs for this assignment, for the common collector amplifier, we'll be checking you off individually, but for the oscillator, and I say oscillators plural, um, we'll be checking you off as a team. How you divide it up in the team is up to the four, three, two, however many of you, we don't really care. Um, as for why we have two oscillators, um, that's something that we will cover in more detail in lectures three and four. It has something to do with the filtering. Um, you can think of it as it being a lot, we, we go, it, it's covered in the assignment specifications, but the general idea is that if you take a really small frequency like one megahertz and you make the jump in one go to 28, uh, using a 28 carrier, it's pretty hard to filter 27 and 29. But if you make it in two steps, let's say you go to 10 first, it's a lot easier to filter 9 megahertz from 11 megahertz than it is to filter 27 from 29. And then you make that same jump in a second step using a second oscillator. And then because you're using 9, then you just have to like filter 27 from like, what's your need for signing? 37 or something? So it becomes a lot easier to filter yes. it if you have the up conversion done in two steps. Uh, we'll talk about some of why that's true in uh, lecture four where we discuss the theory of RF filters. And we'll discuss a lot more about up conversion in lecture three where we'll design our mixer. Um, but for now, um, that's what we'll use it for as the input to the mixer as our carrier signal. And the reason we have two oscillators, and I discussed this in the assignment as well, is to do with the filtering of our output and why it's a lot easier to filter if you do it in two steps than if you do it in one. So that's assignment two, common collector oscillator uh, amplifiers and two local oscillators in your group of four. Uh, it's due two weeks from now, which is when we have lecture three scheduled for the 10th of November. I realize most of you probably have midterms that will end sometime near this Friday. So I, I would encourage you to not worry too much about this for these next few days. Maybe just take a crack at the common collector thing. It shouldn't take you more than a couple hours given the common images that you've already done. And maybe figure out what team you want to do. And then once you're done with midterms, you can start actually getting into the oscillators in your team of four, and that will also hopefully make it a bit easier to work through. All right. And that's everything, unless you have any other questions. Yes, what's up? So if the gain of B is greater than one, and gain of A is greater than one, why is it not just spiral indefinitely higher? Yeah. Wait, you said if A is greater than one? Or no. if their product is greater? If their product is greater than one. Okay, that, okay. The Colpitz oscillator, um, on fact, uh, it actually, so as the amplitude goes in, we're no longer in small signal. Um, and then what will end up happening is uh, the transistor will start to hit into the saturation and cutoff regions as the amplitude gets really large. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, the gain of A will actually decrease as the uh, signal amplitude gets higher. So eventually it'll reach a point where if the amplitude gets any larger, then the gain of the amplifier will decrease. And then if the amplitude gets any smaller, this gain will increase again. So it'll kind of reach a steady state. Reach a, it'll yeah. reach a dynamic equilibrium, so to speak. Of this is the amplitude it oscillates at to not take the amplifier off. Okay. Um, there are videos explaining the math behind that, and they're not very fun. So just that's the that's a very hand wavy way to say it. It is what happens, but um, as far as how to predict what the exact alpha amplitude is going to be. Uh, given this, it's there's a lot involved in that. Right. Um, um, for for our purposes, we're not like concerned with designing exactly a 1.5 volt oscillation. We just need an oscillation that's large enough, like well, you know. Well, one, once you actually build the circuit yeah. in simulation, you get it close. And the physical thing to adjust it, you can you can just tweak re a little bit. You just move it around a little bit until you get exactly what you want. So you can kind of tune the output amplitude uh, by adjusting RE here. Um, that's a really good question, and when we were uh, developing this lecture, that was something that I was also curious about, so nice. Um, let's see. Uh, anything else? All right, I think uh, not too
it's a wrap. Can you hit that? Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Can you hit the red button on there?